I'm uh, John Plunkett, a uh, media journalist. I've been writing about TV for, for nearly 20 years, not without a break. But um, far more interesting than me are the people who are joining me on stage today. The battle for TV sports rights is uh, one of the biggest in town. It's certainly the most expensive. But the evolution of BT TV has been about much more than sport. So over the next hour, we'll be talking content, technology, and probably zombies. You can see if you can work out who's who. Uh, and of course, we'll be taking your questions as well. Um, with me today, uh, on, my, on, my, on my left here, yep, that is my left, uh, is uh, Delia Bushell, who is a managing director of BT TV and BT Sport. Delia is responsible for the strategy, financial performance, and development of the BT TV platform and all of its BT Sports channels. So pretty much everything then. Uh, BT, as you all know, is the latest challenger to Sky's traditional dominance of live top flight, top flight football and has spent nearly £900 million on exclusive rights to the UEFA Champions League and around £1 billion on live Premier League football. I'll be asking Delia about how BT has looked at innovating content and technology and hopefully what it plans to do next. BT announced its first step into exclusive entertainment last year when it launched the AMC channel in the UK for the first time. Which nicely brings me to the gentleman on my far left, who is uh, Harold Gronenthal. Gren uh, Got there second time. Uh, he's Executive Vice President, programming, programming and Operations at AMC Global, and its sister network, Sundance Channel Global. Harold has negotiated global pr programming deals for AMC series such as uh, The Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, and Mad Men. Um, hands up if you've seen one of those. Hands up, keep, keep it up if you've seen all three. Looks like you're winning, uh, Harold. Yeah. Um, and f uh, we'll ask him what AMC's up to, both in the UK and internationally, uh, and how the great global drama game is changing. And finally, in the middle, a face you'll recognize, no doubt, is Jake Humphrey. He is uh, anchor for BT Sports Premier League and FA Cup coverage, and he's also a presenter on its Champions League and Europa League games. Jake spent many years at the BBC, where he was the face of uh, Formula One and hosted live coverage from two Olympics. I'll be asking Jake about what BT is doing both on screen and behind the scenes, and whether Sam Allardyce really is the man to end 52 years of hurt, but only if you're English. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could welcome your panel, that would be fantastic. <laughs> just in a bid to stop me talking, uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of our panelists just very briefly to uh, just tell us about one interesting program they've seen over the last w week or so. Um, who, who wants to start? Delia? Well, I've just, I've just come back from holiday where I basically gorged myself on the Olympics for two weeks. But this week, I've been watching uh, Stranger Things on Netflix, slightly a few weeks behind schedule, but I have to say it's been amazing. It, I just, 1980s clothes, Winona Re Ryder revived. I, for me, it's been, it's been really great. And it features Dungeons and Dragons, is that right? It, well, kind of. Well, yeah. yeah. yeah well, one of my favourite yeah. teenage pursuits, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, Jay? Um, I'm not going to say Celebrity Big Brother. Although my wife might have been watching that. Oh, my God. <laughs> we um, found the viewer. When you, you confessed to the <laughs> behind the scenes in the green room, yeah. I didn't think you were Yeah, it's been good. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to say Full Steam Ahead on BBC Two, which is massively showing my age. It's a show about... Yeah, you watched it as well. It's a show about steam trains. And I was absolutely compelled. And I was in my slippers. And even as I got off the sofa, I went, oh! And I thought, shit, when did this happen? Um, so, yeah. I'm afraid that's the, the sad reality of my life. The Venn diagram of viewers who watch Slippery Big Brother and Full Steam Ahead. There can't be many. Must, <laughs> must be there cannot narrow. be many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Harold, uh, over to you. Uh, a lot of political viewing of late in the States, but I too have been on holiday and actually have been watching uh, Billy Connolly's Tracks Across America. Uh, I'm a Billy Connolly fan, and we don't get Billy Connolly shows in the US, ever. <laughs> right, right. I wonder why that is. Uh, you know, he had a, he, he uh, you remember he had a moment where he replaced uh, Howard Hessman on a show called, um, uh, uh, not leader of the class, but um, head of the class, uh, and it lasted for a season. He, he became the, he was the lead, and that was it. Um, so yeah, when we watch Billy Conley, we have to import PAL DVDs. Do you need subtitles for you? <laughs> Only sometimes. <laughs> Steady on at the Edinburgh TV. Yeah, yeah. Dan dangerous ground. Well, we'll get him in, we'll get him in next year. Um, OK, well, let's get back to what we're here to talk about, which is uh, BT TV and BT Sport. BT TV has, you know, obviously come a huge way, I think, over the last few years. You know, we have chosen in BT Sport to go directly into bidding for rights, uh, launching live channels and a huge amount of digital innovation. And in BT TV, 
we then pull that together with BT Sport. And I think, um, you know, the start of the season is always exciting anyway for, for the sporting season. But I think this year we feel that, A, we've moved our Premier League slot to 5.30, which I think for us gives us a much bigger audience opportunity. In the Where first, was it previously? It was midday Saturday before. Right. And then in the new Premier League um, auction, we moved to, to a 5.30 slot. And the first weekend's gone brilliantly. We've launched a new um, Saturday afternoon football score show called The Score, fronted by Mark Pugach, fresh from Rio. Um, and then Jake's got a new um, Saturday night show after the Premier League game, which has gone very well. So, you know, it's a very exciting start to the season. And then for us, I think we're now in what I'd almost call steady state after a huge 12 months of transformation where we launched our new Champions in Europa League coverage. Um, we took our first step into exclusive content with the launch of AMC. And I think, you know, for the first time for BT, we became a real leader in TV industry and innovation in launching our new 4K set-top box, our live um, BT Sport 4K production, which was actually a, a world first, not just a UK first, um, and then adding Netflix in 4K as well. So. We sort of had a very transformative 12 months, and I think now, um, with the launch of the Premier League and the new, the new formats, we feel in a very good place. And BT TV, as we know, it only launched uh, it's been for, well, since 2013, and you, you joined a, a year later. Yes, yeah. Um, but that was quite a big... You, you coming from a standing start, uh, especially looking at sport for a second, you were coming from a standing start. Sky has been around doing Premier League since 92, 93. What, what, was, the, what was the biggest challenge there for, I think, for BT initially? I think, I think BT had sort of... Partly it was um, taking the position that had been occupied originally by uh, ESPN and Satanta. And you know, obviously both of those having subsequently sort of closed, or in the case of obviously ESPN, we, we picked it up and took it over. Um, there was probably a lot of scepticism as to whether we could make that work. And then partly, obviously, given BT's you know, size, um, it was inevitably going to be compared immediately with Sky Sports, even though it was a, a relative newcomer. And I think we're just, you know, as a team, we're hugely proud of what we've achieved. It's only been a few years. Um, we're still incredibly young in the, the broadcast industry, but I think in terms of the quality of the on-screen coverage and the presenter lineup and so on, led by Jake, in terms of how we've approached digital and innovation, um, and then in the business results that that has delivered for BT and the way in which we have become a consumer price champion in sport and made that deliver commercially for the BT business, you know, we're delighted with the results so far. You mentioned Satanta and, and ESPN. How, how do you ensure you don't just become an, another name on that long list of pretenders to the Sky Throne? Well, I think we've made a pretty amazing start. I mean, look at the, the last Saturday, um, the Premier League first game at 5.30. Now, if you think that we've got at least a third fewer subscribers than Sky Sports overall, we actually outrated them on that game versus their Saturday lunchtime game. So I think you know, BT Sports' ability so far to really cut through and, and punch above its weight has been, been pretty impressive. So you got, is it 1.5 million TV, TV subscribers currently? Is that the right so, so BT Sport has 5 million subscribers. So 3 million of them are direct with BT and the rest are on Virgin. And then BT TV has about 1.5, 1.6 million subscribers. So BT Sport, you can watch whether it's over Sky, whether it's on BT TV, purely on the app. And then, of course, you know, we've just in the last few weeks now launched it on EE. So um, for us, that's almost the big, you know, the big next wave for us is now that uh, BT has acquired the EE business to start pulling that together and to, to now offer that to all of the EE subscriber base and to start to, to give the next wave of growth for BT Sport. So last Saturday's game, was that, was that Leicester Arsenal? The, the... Uh, the, yeah, the opening game was Man City. And then last Saturday was Leicester Arsenal. So yeah. you outrated Sky, but how many viewers did you get on that Saturday tea time slot? Uh, well, last Saturday we peaked at about nine, something like 990,000, yeah. I forget the exact statistics. So, I mean, what's, what's been interesting is... So an average you know, of sort of six, seven hundred... Yeah, average usually, it varies a lot from one game to another. Average can be anything between sort of half a million and a million. And then the peak can be anywhere between one million and two million typically. Um, except for things like obviously Champions in Europa League final where we got to six million across all the platforms. So. Right. But those are pretty big statistics for a relative newcomer, so we're very happy with that. And you mentioned Jake there. Part, part of, I suppose, filling that kind of credibility gap, I suppose, when you first launched, because you were a phone company, essentially a communications company, and suddenly you're, you're, you're now a TV sports broadcaster, was hiring uh, you know, established familiar yes. names like Jake and yeah, many others. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. obviously... 
Jake was the, the, the first person, for us almost, Jake is the face of VT Sport. He was the first person who came on board and his, you know, I think his enthusiasm and dynamism has really been part of what's really carried it forward. But I, I, I think it's pretty worth going to you in the sense yeah, Jake, of, yeah, tell us yeah. About, he has a great story as, as to what tell us about your, and your decision to leave the BBC, you know, yeah. and, and join BT. Tell us about that. How much, how much did you regard it as, as, as a gamble? Um, I don't think I regard that it as a gamble because very quickly um, I was sold on the ambition of BT Sport because if you're a sports broadcaster, you can't work at a broadcaster that's ambitious. You can only work at a broadcaster that's ambitious in the world of sport because the bare reality is that sport is phenomenally expensive to buy the rights and then to cover. So, you know, BT are talking about a Champions League deal of a billion pounds. Um, you all know the numbers that are out there, you know, eight million pounds for a Premier League game is the kind of number that gets thrown around in the press. So unless you work for a broadcaster that sees sport as its sole focus and the, the anchor that pins everything else, then you're going to struggle as a sports broadcaster. Because I think that the world is you know, it's changing fast and very quickly it's heading towards a place where all the big major regular sports events are only going to be on pay-per-view sports channels. And you will still have some listed events and you have some big events like World Cups and Euros and things which will be um, on the BBC or on ITV, Olympics, but you know even the Olympics is now more than likely going to be shared between the BBC and a, another broadcaster who knows who that's going to be. Um, so I was very easily sold on the idea of coming to BT and, and challenging myself really. You know, I remember when I first walked in the room, there was me and three other people and there was no studio and there was nothing but a few Premier League rights. There was no opening titles. And we were literally sitting in a room like a table like this and we were saying, right, what should we have as the music when we come on air with the new Premier League season? And I'll never forget ringing my parents and saying, look, I've made a decision. I'm going to leave the BBC and go to BT. And there was just complete silence on the phone. <laughs> um, but it was only a few months after we launched I was listening to Chris Evans on Radio 2 and there was a moment where I realised the sort of impact that BT had had and he was talking about Warren Beatty and he was just having an you know, off-the-cuff conversation at 8 o'clock in the morning on Radio 2 and he just said, you know, what did you say, Beatty or Beatty? Is it Warren Beatty or is it Warren Beatty, like, you know, Beatty Sport? And it was just part of the conversation on the radio and no one in the studio reacted to it. They knew what he was talking about and that was the thing for me that BT Sport made this incredible splash really quickly and so I don't, I don't think it is a risk. It, w I, it would be a risk now if BT hadn't lived up to the promises they made but since I joined, you know, the Champions League deal's, deal's been done, we've gone again for the Premier League um, and we, as Delia says we've got a better time slot but the key for BT is they cannot stand still because, you know, we have to talk a lot about Sky because they're our biggest rival. Every year they're buying rights, they're changing their studio, they're altering their schedule, you know, there's a comp the, the race and the battle will be constant with them. Um, yeah. And at the moment, you know, it's, a, it's an exciting one to be part of. And you talked about rights and, and the inevitable shift of that into the pay TV market. So in terms of leaving the BBC to join BT, you're kind of backing the winner in a sense. Oh. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose you could say I'm sort of future-proofing myself, if that's, a, if that's a way of terming it. But who knows what the future holds? Because, you know, we are, we are already looking at the Amazons and the Netflix and the YouTubes. And, you know, you know, we, you know, we showed the Champions League and the Europa League final live for anyone that wanted to watch it on YouTube. You know, has that pricked up their ears and they think, right, well, maybe we just go and buy sports rights and stick it on YouTube. You know, there's, you know for Delia and all the guys at the top table at BT, there are challenges coming at them all the time. And it's a case of dealing with what the future holds, but then at the same time building on what we've already created. And, it, and it, we are so young. And that's something I keep saying to people. You know, they keep saying, are you happy with where BT is at? And I'm like, yeah, but it's like three and a half years. You know, the BBC have been broadcasting sport for 60. You know, we've got a long way to go. Uh, and when you were still at the BBC, I think you talked about the, the pain of losing uh, F1 rights when you had to share the F1 rights with yeah. Sky. Do you think it's inevitable that they're going to lose, we've seen them lose the Open Golf now and, and lots of other things. Do you think it's inevitable that the BBC will lose more and more sports rights because they just can't compete? I think the BBC are in a constant challenge and in a, they're in a marketplace where the sports rights are only going one direction and that is becoming more expensive. So it's going to be more of a challenge for them all the time. I still think that the BBC have got a place in all of our hearts and all of us loved watching the Olympics on the BBC. All of us thought the, Olymp the BBC did the most incredible job. And I sit here as someone who's so proud to work for BT Sport and loves everything that we do. But I will also say I don't think anyone in the whole of the UK could have covered the Olympics and given it that national feel like the BBC do. And there will always be a place for that. But it's just how they work with other broadcasters to make sure that they remain relevant. You know, we've, there's a really good, strong relationship between BT and the BBC. You know, the Claire Balding show premiered on BT and then it went across to the BBC. And I think the world has changed where 
they are insular and they keep all their talent to themselves and they keep their sports rights to themselves and they're fighting everyone and the likes of BT are doing the same. I think we're now in an environment where we are more than happy to work with the BBC because we understand how beneficial they are because the BBC brings something that we can't buy and we can't get and we bring something that they can't get. So we're beneficial to each other and I think that that's a relationship that will only get stronger. Well, we have the... With the FA Cup we've shown that Whereas often when sports rights are split between two broadcasters, that can have a sort of negative effect because the narrative gets cut in half and it becomes hard to follow. I think with the FA Cup, we've collaborated so well with the BBC that actually it's created a halo effect between the combined weight of the two broadcasters. Um, you know, that's, that's been fantastic for reinvigorating that franchise. And yeah, it's been a very strong relationship. And the next time they're available, would you want the Olympics on, B, on uh, you know, team, team BT? Well, well, the Olympics are going to discover, uh, Discovery well, Eurosport, so that's, that's right, but yes, the next time, they'll be split. Well, that's time. till 2023. I mean, quite a, quite a long way out. A little out, too so, far yeah, ahead to, yeah. uh, to hypothesize. <laughs> yes. Right, fair enough. Well, I just say it's not all about sport. And uh, Harold, I should bring you in here. You, also, last year, you um, did the deal with AMC, which was to launch um, the AMC UK channel, which is exclusively for BT subscribers in, in the UK. Um, Harold, why the tie-up with BT? Why didn't you just launch a standalone channel? Well, and why now? Well, we've been kicking around <coughs> launching in the UK for years, uh, as far back as the late 90s, and serious talks at the time with certain various parties over here never happened. And so we just kept sort of dancing, if you will, and eventually we found the right partner. And we thought that what BT was offering us was a level of commitment and a level of exclusivity that would allow us to sort of grow the brand in the UK as we both saw fit. Um, so we thought it was a great, a great place to be. Who were those? Who didn't want you? Who did you have negotiations with before? You know, why did, why did they come to fruition? Great question. Right. Great question that's unanswerable. <laughs> 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 well, good. Shame. Good, good shame. Try, shame. Yeah. Um, well, tell me, how does AMC UK work? Because it's, it's, uh, how's it programmed? What goes on it, what doesn't? Because not every AMC show in the US ends up on AMC UK, for instance. Well, you know, anytime you launch a channel, uh, you know, we've, we have AMC channels up throughout the world. And uh, we were a little late to the game. So what happens is we're playing a little bit of catch up where when you don't have a channel and you have a great show like Mad Men or Walking Dead, um, you know, you, those, those shows go out to other broadcasters because you're, you know, you're selling those shows. And eventually, you know, you, you move along and you suddenly have channels and markets. So we're in the game, we're, we're playing catch up a bit. And so we're, as you see, for example, with Fear of the Walking Dead, uh, tremendous amount of competition, tremendous amount of offers to have that show. And we basically said, no, it's, it's, we have an AMC channel. And, and, and so that's how it works. So it, we're slowly playing catch up to, to rights. Not sports rights, but, but nonetheless, you know, same, same sort of ball game, if you will. Because there's another show uh, which has got a lot of press, uh, which Preacher, which is another AMC show, but that's not on the AMC UK. Uh, you, you, that's not on AMC UK, that's on Amazon, for instance. So is that, was that a deal done before, or was that a better yeah, offer, well, or how, how did that work? Is a, Preacher is a co production with Sony. Uh, and so, you know, in the U.S., you're going to have situations where, you know, to compete in the U.S., uh, deals are done with other studios. And Sony, the deal for Preacher sort of pre-existed, if you will, uh, prior to launching in the U.K. And uh, Sony took it out. We, we didn't control those rights specifically. Uh, but you mentioned Fear the Walking Dead, which is the big series, which has just returned for the second half of the second series on, on just AMC start, UK. Just launched on Monday. Yeah. Right. Um, and Dealey, how much is AMC UK, how much is that sort of a, a rebuff or a, uh, to, to Sky Atlantic, which you guys don't have? It feels like no one will ever have Sky Atlantic apart from Sky. Uh, so you've got your own kind of Sky Atlantic, as it were. I think, I think it was much more of a kind of broader strategy, which is, you know, for consumers, it's relatively simple that the two biggest motivators for taking up pay TV are premium sport and premium <laughs> drama. Um, with BT Sport, we chose to do premium sport in a direct owned way. But with drama and entertainment, I think we've always felt more of a partnership model makes sense and that there are many different routes as to where good content is going to come from. Um, so actually, the first step in our strategy was to get Netflix onto the platform and do what was then a global first deal where you could bundle it into your BT subscription and your BT bill. Um, but we always felt that on top of that, we needed a layer of some exclusive content that you could you know, wrap a sort of marketing around in a similar way, actually, that Sky's done to good effect with Sky Atlantic. 
such that you had some points of light and moments of exclusivity of premium drama across the year um, to then combine with all the other entertainment channels and things like Netflix into sort of a more rounded offering alongside sport. So when the AMC opportunity came up last, you know, year, last Easter, um, we thought that was extremely interesting and also because Fear the Walking Dead was then soon to launch and could be part of that deal and also was simultaneous with our, our, our launch of Champions League. It gave us an opportunity to extend what we call the kind of multi-platform strategy of BT Sport, which is we're on our TV platform, we're on Sky's platform, we're, you know, we're ubiquitous and actually wrap AMC in with that and make it not just exclusive to BT TV subscribers, but actually exclusive to BT overall. So you can be a BT broadband sub and get... AMC Um, and I just think you know AMC's pedigree and track record in premium drama is you know is almost unrivaled so you know for us it was a a great partner to pull in and and take the first step into exclusive entertainment with. And it's got huge ratings uh, around the world but can I get a sense I don't know how how many people for instance watch Fear the Walking Dead on on on, on, on AMC UK. So we have a mix so there's there's live ratings and then actually probably where it's been most valuable for us is in the on demand. Now as you probably know drama is typically watched more on demand than in live and so where we're seeing the biggest value at the moment is on BT TV in the catch up it's really pushing traffic into that so we, we have what we call uh, on the UV platform we've got a number of you know on demand players and apps at the moment for example Netflix has the most usage even more than BBC iPlayer and then AMC and all the catch up on fear and all of its shows and the on-demand access to it has probably been the biggest driver for us. So is there just a ballpark figure for overnight and total? For, for, for which? For, 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 for current series or for yeah, previous? Yeah, so typ- or just to typically sort of in the 50 to 100 thousands depending whether it's opening episode or later in the season. I don't know, you probably give a better overview oh, rating. We're still consolidating the numbers. And yeah. probably triple That's, that when it's consolidated. Yeah, because yeah, so you, you have to sort of yeah, it, was just, it was just Monday night, so we're still waiting for right. the consolidated numbers. So you've got Netflix. Amazon Prime, will that be on the platform? Any, any we any we would like to. That's something we're looking at next. Um, you know, I think a key, a key future innovation for us, for, for our TV platform, for UView, is that we're now developing a whole new user interface for it. That will actually be more Netflix-like, more graphics-rich, um, very easy to navigate between linear and on-demand. And we are effectively rebuilding UView, ready for that at the end of the, this year, start of next year. And then following that, we're looking at launching quite a lot of apps on top of that, because we want to build out a lot more of our apps and on demand, as well as our linear channels, and kind of keep pushing down both those fronts. And Sky Atlantic? Oh, we used to be at Sky, of course, but you know, yes. would you, would, how much would you love Sky Atlantic? on? on we, we, would, we would love we'd love all the Sky channels. I mean, I'd love Sky One, Sky Atlantic, all the rest of the Sky Sports channels. We, we very much like access to all of them, and unfortunately, so far, haven't been able to, um, but clearly they're fantastic channels and you know Sky's track record in broadcasting is fantastic, so we'd love those. Is that because you can't agree on a figure or because they're just not playing ball? Uh, we, can't, we just can't get access to them. Obviously I can't comment on right. sort of commercial negotiations, but we, we would love to have them. Um, Jake, said, you said your ambitions for BT, you wanted it to be uh, sport with a smile yeah. and uh, you wanted to make it a, a warmer, friendlier, more personal experience that, that, than Sky, I presume. Correct, yeah. How have you done that and have, have you done it? Um, I like to think we've done that. I guess the audience are the ones to decide that. And the way we've done it really is by trying to have people with a personality on our channel and even more than that, encouraging people to share their personality. Because I think sometimes when you cover sport, you can get so caught up in the minutiae and the detail and it very quickly becomes technical and it doesn't become about people. And for me, sport is all about people. Um, you know, when I used to go and when I was at the BBC and I used to have meetings with, with people um, outside of sport, I used to have to explain to them because, you know, it used to amaze me how little they watched of live sport because I love it. I don't understand why they don't because for me, it was a huge event that brought the whole nation together. People who were watching it really cared about it. You never were able to write a script for it properly because you didn't know what was about to happen. That's the real thrill for me is that you, you, know, you go on air and you've got really no idea where the show will end up at the end. Um, it's a big event and you're bringing the, everyone together for that. But I think probably even more than any of those things is that it's something that people really, really care about. And that's where it becomes quite difficult as a broadcaster because I've never worked on anything that brings as much scrutiny as football coverage. And everyone's tried different things. You know, Channel 5 with their highlights of Football League last season or the season before brought an, an audience in and very quickly football fans made their feelings clear. You know, Sky tried to do something bold and different with Friday Night Football and again, you go on social media and you can see what people think of it. And 
And so when we first started, it was very tricky to try and work out what this fine dividing line is between giving people a nice, comfortable, relaxing approach to sport and then making sure that we deliver for the hardcore football fan, what you'd probably call the vocal minority, because if they're not happy with what you're doing, you can rest assured that they will be all over Twitter letting you know. And people often think if you're on the telly, you don't see what people say about you on Twitter. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> you're fully aware. Um, and I don't know that much like Frankenstein, but I'm tall. Um, <laughs> And so it's about <laughs> trying to do what you think is right, but also trying to please the audience. And it is a very difficult balancing act. And I think the best thing for us is using people with personality. You know, and again, if you put Ian Wright on the telly or you put Robbie Savage on the telly, people will go, oh, no one likes him because all they do on social media is moan about Robbie Savage. That's wrong. Robbie Savage has got a personality. So you either like him or you don't like him, which for me is an awful lot better than having no opinion at all about somebody. And he, kn- and he knows his stuff. He does, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he knows about tackling. Yeah. Less about scoring from 30 yards out, but that's, <laughs> that's uh, And you did, well, you did various things. Well, uh, you, you, did, um, uh, you did post-match interviews for a while outside the grounds. Yep. But you had to, uh, there was an unfortunate incident, which you might want to tell us about, which meant you had to abandon it. Was it at, yeah, we were, live at, at, we were live at Arsenal, and I won't repeat what the chant was, but we were live on air. Um, and someone said, maybe we need to get a sign made saying, please don't swear. And I was like, if you do that, then we're in a world of trouble because they're football fans. This was the Arsenal um, fans behind the... It was the Arsenal fans, yeah. Um, and they, were, they were chanting and we, you know, we've got... Our floor manager used to be in the SAS and even he couldn't quiet them down. And he can't deal with it. And then no one can. But, you know, we, we, like everybody else, tried to make our own mark and tried to do our own thing. And for a while, we thought the answer was to be in studio in Stratford. But it wasn't because we were detached from the sport happening in the stadium. And we thought that we had this great big pitch and we could do half-time and full-time analysis with a load of guys on the pitch. Um, actually reenacting what had just happened on a football field. But again, it's a very hard thing to make it work. So then we moved to the stadiums and we were pitch side for the whole game and we thought maybe that was the answer. But then it kind of became clear that as soon as the game was over, we were standing in an empty, windy football stadium and it didn't feel like gold standard Premier League quality. So we've ended up now in a position that I think is perfect for our Premier League programming, which is we come on air at five o'clock, we're by the pitch, and I love that because you're reacting to what's happening. You've got players warming up behind you. You feel completely connected to the atmosphere building up. And at Leicester this weekend, the atmosphere was incredible. And I think it's really important that we plug into that because that's people that are not there need to feel what the atmosphere is like. And that was a big thing for me on the Formula One. You know, I've, I'm just a sort of, as I say, a lanky bloke from a little village in Norfolk. You know, and if I am lucky enough to land a job presenting Premier League football or Formula One, I want to try and take people as close as possible to being there and seeing what's involved in my job. So we do our build up from the pitch and then we go to a really nicely designed brand new studio for half time and full time where we can actually hear each other properly. We can see, you know, the analysis coming into us. It's a much more professional way to cover the game. And so I think we've found a really nice balance of personality and atmosphere with giving people what they expect, which is the best analysis of football. And I think with the pundits that we've got now, and you know, if anyone was lucky enough to watch the game at the weekend and see Premier League tonight afterwards, you know, the combination of Michael Owen, Ian Wright, and Robbie Savage was fantastic, and, and that's the key. It's not just about having brilliant players, it's about having brilliant pundits and getting the mix of them right. And all this takes time, and we've been on there for three years, and oh my God, we're still learning every single week. We learn something new about how to improve it. And uh, Delia, every, every Premier League game, it's, uh, I think it was 7.6 million you, you paid for it in the, in the last deal. How, how, do you, how, how does that add up? So, I mean, so far it's added up extremely well. So, I mean... It, Going back several years, the BT consumer business had been in you know, fairly steady decline on both a revenue and a, a profit basis. And once we launched BT Sport, we reversed that decline and we've now um, you know, seen steady growth in both revenue and profit. And you know, it's clearly paying back for us. And we look at, we measure it end to end, but essentially what we found is it's helped to stimulate the acquisition of new broadband subscribers. And you know, we've got a set of, of BT Sport Plus you know, broadband and voice customers who are now much happier with the overall service they're getting from BT. Um, And then I think beyond that, it's really done something quite special for the BT brand overall. You know, BT's always had a fantastic sort of traditional Middle England, quite family-centric, you know, well-trusted brand, but it hadn't had probably that sort of extra pizzazz of a sense of innovation, of the kind of emotional engagement with a brand that content can give you. Um, and I think both for customers and also even for staff and you know, employees and call centre agents, etc., it's just had an effect on the whole business that has created a lot of momentum that's had a halo effect across everything. 
And is it all about broadband? Because I was coming up on the train and the, the family next to me are BT Sport uh, subscribers, you know, uh, and uh, big fans of Breaking Bad. So it's like they've been placed there by some kind of, <laughs> some kind of higher power. And, um, we could, but we're not that good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, they, but they're Virgin Media subscribers. So, so, so is, that, is, that a, is that like a one nil win for you? Or is it, did Virgin Media edge it in, in their case? You know, because they're not... Sorry, they're, edge it meaning... Well, they, they don't subscribe to BT Broadband. They're, still, they, they're Virgin Media. Well, no, I mean, obviously, we, we wholesale BT Sport to Virgin. That's a really um, important relationship to us. It works very well. Um, and so, you know, we very deliberately, from the start of BT Sport, were multi-platform and ubiquitous because I think when you're bidding for sports rights at that kind of level of expense, you've got to go to scale with incredible speed. And I think you know, Jake's very good at always quoting the line that I think um, it took Sky something like 20 years to get to, to 5 million Sky Sports subscribers, but we did it in about 10 months, 12 months. Um, and going from zero to five million in that first year is what has enabled us to to succeed and to be able to keep rebidding for rights. So we want to use many different platform partnerships to make that work. I guess the context is that it was free with you know it was free for a while and then it's what six pounds now. So it's it's a lot you know yes, your product yeah. is well, a lot cheaper than Sky Sports. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Right, okay. And where'd you go next for rights? You've got the Ashes uh, yes, in so Australia. That's the next, that's the next big 18. thing for us. So we're sort of getting ready in the background our, our first entry into cricket coverage, which is very exciting. That will launch in November, and then the Ashes will be the following Christmas. Um, so, you know, we very much want to do to the coverage of cricket similar things to that we've done, particularly actually to rugby. Um, although obviously football is obviously the biggest sport and we talk a lot about that, actually I think we're incredibly proud of our rugby coverage and the quality of the analysis and the way that we've made it very entertaining but also very insightful and we want to do, what we, what we want to do for cricket something similar things that we've, we've done for rugby. Yeah, cricket, um, will you take the Australian you know, programming and, and, and top and tail? How will you do that? You won't, it won't be entirely... Well, it, it'll depend on, it'll depend on the, the event. So some, some will take the host feed, some will completely shoot ourselves and we're obviously going to line up our own range of pundits yeah, and who's presenters. Who's going to present it? Yeah, who have you got? Um, I can't reveal that. I don't think we've revealed that, have we? No. I'm, looking at, I'm, right. not, I'm not allowed to tell you that yet. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> Watch we, this face. we just get some names? Yeah, they, yeah. They're going to be good, yeah. <laughs> right, right, okay. Um, and you mentioned this, but the Champions League final was you, you put free in all kinds of places. Yes. This so, year, last so, time around. Yeah, it was on it, YouTube, it was, it was on f- your Freeview. We, it, was, it had a couple of, sort of different motivations, but what we wanted to do... So it feels t- like you spent all this money. It feels, it's either genius marketing or madness that you put it out for free, having spent Well, no, I mean, the, cha- the, Champions, the Champions and Europa League finals are always free-to-air, right. almost everywhere in the so world. So it's not madness, it's entirely no, free-to-air. No, no, it was, yeah, always, yeah, yeah. That was, so that it was always going to be free-to-air. And then I think what we wanted to do was take the kind of digital innovation mantle that we felt we'd really grabbed and then use the final to take that to the next level. Um, and so, you know, it was always going to be on BT Sport Showcase, the free-to-air service, and on the BT.com website and the BT Sport app. And then what we did was also partner up with YouTube um, to run an experiment, both to see how many people would actually watch this live on YouTube, but also for us it was a, you know, a genuine, um, valuable marketing exercise because we effectively created lots of digital leads for us to then market you know, over the summer to, to build new subscribers ready for next season. So it was kind of a partly a strategic innovation initiative, partly to drive maximum reach that we could for the finals and partly, you know, a good commercial sense. And, you know, it really surpassed expectations. So we did six million across all platforms for each of the Champions League and Europa League finals. And there was something like 1.8 million watching live just on digital platforms, not even on TV. Um, and then the other thing that I think we've done that's slightly different is with Champions and Europa League for the first time, UEFA has allowed us to do a lot more with clip rights, um, almost live real time. And so we saw something like 2 million downloads of, of clips over the next 24 hours post the, the final itself. So it was, you know, it was a very good experiment. And You'll be doing more, more, more of the same? Possibly, yes. We, can't, we, we haven't decided how much we'll do. Also, we have certain games free to air. Um, and it's done extremely well. Uh, we want to push, in the first instance, we'll probably push our own app to start with, but we, we're certainly interested in looking at repeating it. And I, I think this is really important ground, actually, for BT, because I'm a firm believer that sport should be available to as many people as possible, because sport is inspirational, and the more that watching sport on the TV, like the Olympics the last couple of weeks, or a big Premier League game, or whatever it is that you watch, maybe not the UFC, you go out and repeat it in the park. Um, <laughs> and so how do we make sure that we still do that to people, despite the fact that sports rights have become 
phenomenally expensive and they've become phenomenally expensive and it's not necessarily BT's fault that that's happened or even Sky's fault that's happened. You know, that's just the way the world has gone. But it's really important for us to do everything that we can to still make it as accessible as possible to people. So when I first came to BT, part of the reason for me signing up and ticking the yes box was because they said, look, our initial plan is that if you take BT Sport, uh, if you take BT Broadband, BT Sport is something that will come your way for free. And that was really important for me because I didn't want to just go and work on a channel that was hidden behind this phenomenal paywall because it's very easy for people at home who've had sport for free on you know, traditionally the BBC and ITV for the last 50 years to have a real dislike for these channels that have appeared and are charging big money for people to be able to watch sport that previously was free. Now that's the way the world has gone, but I don't think BT have had the credit for doing everything they can to still open this up to people. You know, how many other broadcasters would spend a billion pounds on the Champions League rights and then say, do you know what, we will work with UEFA to find a way to give the final to everybody. And no one goes, oh, bloody hell, that's amazing. All they do is go, oh, I used to get the Champions League for free on ITV anyway. But that, that, you're kind of missing the point. The reality is that, that is what the Champions League now costs. People like BT can afford to buy it. Not many other people can. But we're still going to do what we can to open it up to you. And the same with giving people, you know, free with BT Broadband or, you know, free with the, with the, the UV box. However B BT work it out, they are absolutely doing their bit to make this more accessible for people. And that is a key message because... It's very easy for football fans and sports fans generally to have a dislike of the way the world is going and we need to do what we can to make them realise that this is happening but we will try and make as many of you able to watch this as possible because we're fully aware of how hard it can be for some people. I think particularly at big moments, so like when Liverpool reached the Europa League final in particular, I think the Liverpool fans weren't expecting it to be broadcast free to air and my email inbox was kind of deluged with fans just saying thank you BT it was really kind of you we weren't expecting it to be free to wear and let alone on YouTube and I could watch it anywhere and it just it worked incredibly well yeah. on, on so many levels I think to have done that. And you talked about your partnership with the, with the, the BBC and you've got a lot of BBC former and current BBC faces of course on the channel how much going touching on that point for instance with a uh, rights like Wimbledon for example I know they've tied up with the BBC again for several years but further down the line can you see a, uh, could you imagine uh, some sort of tie up where a lot of a lot of games are on BT behind a paywall but at the same time well, for, lots for, of it is free to wear Wimbledon it's a bit yeah. like the, the Olympics point Eurosport have done a sort of deal where they can simulcast Wimbledon in future or I think it's elements of it I'm not I can't remember the exact details so that one probably not but I think we, you know, BT Sport is very open to free-to-air partnerships, not just with the BBC, but also with ITV Channel 5, Channel 4, you know, and the others. Because we have been a price champion in sport and because BT Sport is only £6 or free with BT TV, we're not protecting an incredibly high price point and therefore we're a bit less binary in the pay versus free debate and we're quite happy to share rights and co-promote and collaborate with free-to-air. Um, you know, as Jake said, to make sure we we give rights holders maximum reach and profile of their sport, um, and we can make that model work. So I think both with BBC and with other players, we're open to that. When, when they introduced The Walking Dead, uh, there were some people who thought, oh, this won't work. You know, could, could zombies be the new vampires? Because I think we were writing a, a real crest of, of vampire movies and TV and all the rest. And of course, I think zombies are more than the new vampires, so, um, and people love it. Even my 12-year-old said, you know, Dad, I didn't like it at the beginning, but I like those zombies now. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Guardian tried to, uh, kind of, tried to work out what, why they were so successful, and they said, uh, um, well, they said, Fear the Walking Dead, it innovates exactly the right amount within a, within a set formula, the, the, the reassuring knock and rattle of strangers dribbling at the door. <laughs> um, and a consolation of sorts in these troubled times. You know. Um, but Fear the Walking Dead, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a prequel and a spin-off, um, right. and it set global records, is that right, for the, for the first series when, when it came right. out last year? That's absolutely right, yeah. Uh, number one in, in uh, many markets around the world, uh, and still the top, uh, the top uh, you know, prequel, sequel, spin-off, your, pick your, your, uh, you know, your brand or your, your moniker uh, in the U.S., um, but I guess the first time we became aware, I guess, well, you know, the industry became aware of AMC was probably Mad Men, sort of 2005, 2006, is that right? 2006, yeah. yeah. Um, but before then, it was, uh, well, it used to be American movie classics, and it was a, yeah, it was a very so, different beast, if you go back. Yeah, AMC actually started uh, in uh, 1979, 1980 as a, as a movie channel, and it was old movies. And at the time, believe it or not, um, 
you know, Chuck Dolan, who was the founder of HBO and Cablevision and our, you know, uh, still our chairman emeritus, um, called the studios and said, what are you doing with your old movies? And they kind of laughed at him, like, who wants these old movies? And, uh, you know, and he launched AMC, and really for nickels on the dollar. Um, because at the time, you know, cable was still uh, in its infancy. Uh, and then by 2006, though, we realized that the future was not going to be movies, or at least a channel that was only movies, and that we had to develop shows that had a, a flavor and a feel and, and, and created a brand. And we decided to go the path of, um, you know, high-quality drama, and Mad Men was the first uh, in that, uh, obviously, in that series of Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Walking Dead. So uh, I'd argue that in 2010, if you were in the industry, you knew AMC. And what we see around the world now is 10 years later, consumers know AMC. And I think that's part of the spillover of the success of those shows. And AMC also owns half of uh, BBC America. Tell us about that. You, you now, essentially, you control what goes on BBC America. Uh, yeah, BBC, you... BBC America was um, a partnership with Discovery and then it sort of spun off on its own uh, and they realized at some point that the U.S. team that being a standalone is very, very difficult in the U.S. as I'm sure it is here. And so, yeah, we became, we did a JV, a joint <coughs> venture with the BBC. So we operate uh, and manage BBC America. And you were co-production partners on The, the Night Manager, is that, is that right? The Night with Manager, the BBC. yes, was one of the shows where we were co-producers on. Yeah, we had the U.S. rights. BBC obviously had the UK rights, and we picked up uh, various rights in other territories in the world. Do you ever think of drama now purely in the terms of the US market, or is the whole thing you think, right, this, this has got to work, everything we do has got to work globally? I don't think anybody thinks about it anymore, specifically with the US in mind. I, I mean, I do think, obviously, we have a focus on what we think will work best in the US market. That's obviously a, a, a prime goal of ours, but I don't think any broadcaster uh, can only have their territory in mind when they're doing a show. I think it's a, it's a, it's a big market at the moment, uh, and probably bigger than it's ever been. And one of the shows there people might notice but might not know about was the one with uh, David Schwimmer in it. Uh, tell us about it. Is it Feed the Beast, Feed the which beast. is not, not zombies? Not zombies. Right. No, but a show the about, beast is met up, you know. about two brothers, one of who, and who opened, uh, opened a restaurant uh, under some fishy circumstances, one brother, uh, attempting to sort of be, uh, how would I describe it, to be the, the, the white knight, the other brother constantly getting in trouble uh, and constantly sort of fouling things up. Uh, David Schwimmer's return to series TV, actually. Right, yeah, I guess the last thing he was in was, uh, I don't know, Band of Brothers briefly, but uh, briefly. it's going back a long way. Yep. Um, I did mention I, I wanted to talk about technology, and there is this, uh, there's a booth downstairs which is worth a visit, which is uh, it's a kind of Fear the Walking Dead uh, virtual reality experience, which... Uh, I can't tell you too much about, uh, but uh, well, I can because I've done it, but uh, uh, I'm not allowed to. But anyway, I'd recommend it. Go and, ha go and have a look for yourself. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's worth uh, it's worth a stumble into and a stumble out of, uh, as I discovered. How are you, how are you using virtual reality? Is it is it going to be is it going to be like three D? Kind of, we'll get excited about it, and then two years later, so I, so the, the I'm set's a, in the I'm bin. I'm quite a three D luddite in the sense that I still now just don't like sitting watching a movie in three D. I have a headache by the end of it. I think um, VR is interesting in a quite different way and certainly for sport it's a kind of gamification almost of television viewing it's not something I think you'd ever sit and watch an entire football game in VR but what it does is add moments where you can enhance the experience in a quite dramatic way you know whether that's because you can um, watch a goal in replay pointing but to the goal and suddenly see from behind the goal or around from any angle that you want to but I think it's going to be something that people will use a lot to punctuate their viewing across a game, just to add another level of, of insight or different camera angles. I don't know if you saw, um, <laughs> the, the thing that I think is best actually is, people think about VR as being very goggle centric and I think probably mass market it, it will be. Um, but if you haven't seen it yet, go down and look at the, the app we've got on the stand of the America's Cup. Because um, when the America's Cup Portsmouth leg happened a few weeks back, we put a set of 360 GoPro cameras on the actual racing boats um, and you, without goggles, you can now just see it on an enhanced app variant where you can actually 360, you're effectively you're like one of the, the competitors on the boat during the race and you can just move the app around to look 360 and move it from different angles and that's absolutely spectacular, I think. 
And in many ways, that's an easier way to get real consumer value out of VR, um, you know, in addition to the, to the goggle approach. But they're still very much kind of test phase at the minute. You're, you're very much kind of dipping your water. There's not <coughs> offerings. Or we, are there well, offerings we've, out we've there done now quite a lot. We've done, done an FA Cup trial. We're actually going to shoot a Bundesliga game in, in VR this week. Um, we've but it done depends America's on Cup. A kit at home. Yes, well, obviously, I think, you know, given that we've now got EE and a lot of this relates to mobile apps and, and mobile handsets and, you know, mobile providers, then we're now working very closely with EE on how BT Sport and EE join together on this. Uh, so we're looking at all sorts of, sort of interesting things in that area. And then I think the question is, in what way do you scale it up, you know, and, and what's, the, you know, what's the right approach to take for consumers? And we're still working through the testing and trialling on that at this point. Right. It's what they want, though, I think, consumers. If you yeah. look at sport, and, and in many ways it's almost a bit stealthy and you don't really notice it happening, but if you watch rugby, there's now little cameras on the refs, you know, mm. ref cam, um, you know, talking about the America's Cup stuff, you know, having, a, having a, a camera on somebody so that you feel like you're on the boat is what people are after. It won't be very long, I don't think, until tiny cameras are on football shirts <laughs> um, and you're able to actually choose, if you want to, to, to be a player during a football match and watch a match from their perspective and people are not going to sit there in their millions and all watch a football match from the perspective of Wayne Rooney um, because before long he would just be sitting on the bench anyway and that wouldn't be great but I think that what people want when it comes to sport is they want to be closer to the action all the time you know the, the Wiggins cam from the Olympics for example when Bradley went for his gold medal and they had the you know they made sure that the bike in front of him at all times had a little camera on so you saw Bradley Wiggins face like that close is that what you want to see? I don't know, but people want, the broadcasters want to get you as close as possible to these people who are achieving these incredible super, superhuman feats. And I think it's up to us to constantly be pushing the envelope. And, you know, last year, as Dili said, we were the first people to broadcast, you know, big live sports events in, in Ultra HD and 4K. And we are the place to do that because I think in going forwards in the future, most of us, my daughter, will only watch two things live on the TV, I think, or maybe three big national events news and sport. Those are the places where we will watch live television. Um, and so those are the areas that you can innovate with this kind of thing. And those are, the, those are the times that we will want to rely on technology to get us closer to that. There are some amazing statistics now that I saw in the last few weeks. So in, in the 16 to 24 age group, um, only something like 30, 35% of their TV viewing is now done to live TV, mm. where the national average is about 63%. <coughs> and for the over 65s, it's about 85%. So you're seeing now the generational shift become really quite yeah. dramatic. Um, you know, and I agree, I think live sport will be, and news will be the final bastion of yeah. live viewing. And also, if you're young now, you don't, you, know, you don't watch it on the TV, you watch it on your tablet, and as, you know, you've got on your goodie bags, you've got these little bits of cardboard that have been folded up and turned into these VR headsets. So it's not expensive, and it's very easy for 11-year-olds to be in their bedroom watching a football match with a VR headset, and that will be happening. So we've seen lots of sport and lots of AMC uh, shows, but Didi, uh, Didi when, when are you going to start making? When's, when's, BT, when's a BT drama production going to come up at the end of a show? On, uh... I, think, I think at the moment we've got lots of different avenues of building that through our entertainment and, and drama offering, and I think we'll do it piece by piece. Um, we are absolutely, we have, I'm being pitched almost sort of daily by commissioners and Hollywood studios who would love us to go direct into that in, in, with the same scale and and clout that we have done for BT Sport. To become a production um, partner. To be, yeah, to become a production partner and, you know, and, to, and to go full scale into that. I think we see a partnership model probably as more viable in that area than, than it was for BT Sport. Clearly, if you're bidding for sports rights and you know, there's huge confidentiality and huge financial risk, you've got to do that in a sort of 100% owned way. Whereas I feel with, for drama and entertainment, you can do a sort of more multi-layered model um, with different partnerships and you know, what you're trying to do is get consumers what they want um, and there's, there's a lot of things out there already whether that's AMC, Netflix, Amazon etc um, to deliver that so what we are really more thinking through is what's the layer of exclusivity and the point of difference you need BT TV to have to keep accelerating you know, the growth momentum um, and we've got a few few interesting ideas up our sleeve. But right, I'll, do you want to share them? <laughs> no. Right, OK. Uh, well, we've got five minutes or so left, so I did say we'd have some questions. I've got lots more questions here, but if uh, anyone wants to put their hand up, we will uh, uh, please do. Uh, yes, there's a... Just on there. If you can wait for the mic, that'll be uh, fantastic. Oh, there you are. Great. Hey there. I'm Pasha from Cachette. Um, I was going to ask... Arguably, uh, you turned with AMC. You turned like zombies, a subculture, into mainstream. 
uh, or help do that along with films and things as well. But with sport, maybe there's, is there a, an angle to do that as well? I, I personally wouldn't pay to watch traditional sport on TV, but I'd probably watch maybe e-gaming or drone racing. Um, is there any sort of plans to bring that sort of stuff to the... Or, or try and turn that into a mainstream sport for us? Yeah, I think it's, it's an area that we are looking at as well. And particularly, I think, given that we're a broadband player, there's a sort of natural join-up between sport and broadband in the, in the gaming sector. You know, again, there are a number of, of players out there. You know, I think, for example, on, you know, on Amazon Fire TVs, Twitch is doing extremely well. Um, so, you know, I think, again, for us, it's about... What's, is, it, is it just bringing third-party partners on who are already doing this, or is it about doing something on our own? And that, that we are looking at. Um, but, but definitely, I think that's, that's... And particularly for us as well, as we now move into the, you know, what we feel is the new era of BT, where we've also got EE. EE has a quite a younger demographic that's much more square on target for those kinds of things. So I think what you'll see BT do over the next year or two is start to really look and think about its content strategy as both BT and EE together, um, and you know, start to see what that can unlock. Cool. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, and one more question at the back there on the uh, left-hand side. Thank you. Hey there. I, I was wondering if you guys ever think about doing uh, original UK commissions for uh, AMC. Uh, probably more of a question for Harold. I mean, I think in in the short term such fantastic quality co content comes out of the US and it's, it's stronger for us to leverage off the scale and production values of the US um, AMC originals than to sort of go into UK originals. But, you know, in, in, the, in the medium or longer term, never say never. So, no, I'd, yeah. I'd agree. And it's certainly something we've been, we, we've been looking at. I mean, you know, as much as Delia is, is pitched, we're pitched as well. And uh, yeah, there's no reason why we, we couldn't see ourselves doing uh, original uh, UK content. And we have the, we have the perfect place to, uh, to play it out. And I guess Netflix is, uh, they're making their first UK-based drama with The Crown. So that's, uh, that's, they've, they've already made the switch. Yep. But not, yep. not one you've done, not yep. one done you've done yet, yeah. Okay, any more questions? I've got plenty here. Uh, here we go, yes, in the middle, please, just at the back, thank you. If you can wait for the... Uh, here it, here it comes. Hi, just to get back to the sport thing again, um, I just wondered if you had ever considered, I find myself, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, uh, in the middle of various contracts with various suppliers, um, BT Sport being one of them because I'm a MotoGP widow, uh, so we subscribe to that and because we've got Sky, we pay the most expensive package with you guys. Would you ever consider... Um, doing a, a, a setup where you could pick and choose the sport that you subscribe to. Obviously, pay a bit more, but less than the full on twenty, whatever twenty two, I think, or something around about that a month. Uh, so my my personal view on that is, um, while customers will say they want to be able to just pick and choose, in reality they like clarity and simplicity, and. Even the model that we've got, where it's free with BT TV or six pounds with BT Broadband or an app, you'll have a lot of people trying to understand what price it is on what platform. And I think adding more layers of complexity to that becomes quite hard to market in a mass market way as a proposition to consumers. Um, and you know, I think at the prices that we are operating at, there isn't really the need to unbundle. You know, I think clearly if if it's uh, you know, other players like if it's if it's a sort of fifty, sixty pound type sport bundle, then that question is probably more relevant for a consumer. But if if the pricing choice you've already got to make is zero or six, I think the scope to try and unlock micro layers in the middle of that is is harder. Yeah, I, I guess that's that's fair comment. Um, I don't know if this is on or oh, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I guess that's fair comment. Um, and I guess I need to look at my subscriptions. I just seem to be subscribing to so many different things for <laughs> Netflix for one thing, Sky for something else. Obviously, BT Sport now because you guys have got the contract for MotoGP, so I end up. Well, keep watching. Like we so MotoGP, we yeah. had the first British winner in history we did, last yes, weekend. So and keep a watching. Boy from not too far down our <laughs> road, uh, won the Moto3 this weekend from Oban, which we're very pleased about. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, the the MotoGP GP coverage is very good, I have to say, and the red button stuff is um, 
you've done a pretty good job with that. Uh, there's, it's, it, it is good. Yeah, um, it's a fantastic product, it really. I just I seem to be paying up. I don't need the football. A, <laughs> a bit like the VR conversation, I think MotoGP is just phenomenal because you have cameras on the back of each bike, and therefore when you watch them go around bends, it's like, for me it's just amazing. I'm watching it in the flesh. You watch the the riders, and yeah, you have to be almost crazy to be a MotoGP rider. It's almost like suicidal each time. Not far off. Yeah. But I, I think this is quite an interesting point, though, because I think what this comes back to is that people still see BT Sport as something so new and so different in their lives, because it takes people a long time to get used to what they watch on the television. You know, we were saying earlier on, people still look at the One Show as a new program on the BBC One, well, and it's been you know a decade old now. And I often get messages on social media and whatever, people going to me, oh, I can't believe it, man. I already pay 65 quid a month for Sky. Now I've got to pay another six quid for BT Sport. And that's because we're the new player in the market. We've sort of arrived after Sky. And I feel like replying back and going, oh, have you got this a bit back to front, haven't you? Maybe the issue is the 60 quid, not the six quid. But people have been paying that 60 quid since 1996. So they, sort of, they do that already. And what they don't want is to pay the additional six. And I think sometimes, you know, it's a perception thing that there's more money you have to shell out now to get sport and actually if people took a really careful look at what BT are offering in comparison to other other opportunities you know they, they would realize that BT are doing what they can to, to drive it in, in an opposite direction and I think everybody should want BT sport to be successful because the longer BT are around then the more of a challenge in the longer term they can apply to Sky which is going to do two things it's going to drive up the quality of all the broadcasting for everyone because we're competing against each other and drive down the cost and that is just the way it will be because you know, this battle will rage on. OK, well, thanks for those questions. And I should say the final whistle has uh, been blown. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, thanks to you all for coming. And th a big thanks to everyone who joined me on stage today, uh, Delia, Jake and Harold. Uh, and also a huge thanks to the sponsors of this, sponsors of this session, who were BT. Uh, don't forget... <laughs> Funny that. <laughs> Whoever they are. Discovery? Yeah, we, sh we should talk about them sometime. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I think it was BT, wasn't it? Well, Wasn't it you guys? There was an opening video that was Discovery. Sure, it was BT, Delia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're getting the good Don't price. knock it. <laughs> Just no one told Discovery, right? Um, uh, two things. Uh, one is don't forget the uh, Fear the Walking Dead virtual reality experience, which is on the ground floor. Uh, you can't miss it. And also the Fear the Walking Dead drinks are about to start, also on the ground floor. And uh, they're free, so they won't cost you an arm and a leg. Oh, Thank you very much. Good what night. a way to end. Uh,